God, we're praying now for you to give us greater hope. When I look at my own capabilities, I wonder how things are going to work. I look at my resources and doubt if you really can use me. Your word teaches us to trust in you with all of our heart, to lean not on our own understanding. So in this moment, I pray that we would live for something bigger than ourselves. Help us to live generously, that we would find hope and purpose as we follow where you are leading. I pray that my family will follow you just as desperately as I do, that they wouldn't live for the fleeting passions of the world, but that they would seek you with all of their heart. I remember what life was like before following you, and God, I don't want to go back to how it was then. You've already done so much for us and through us, and somewhere between then and now, our closed fists became raised hands, our walking became running, our apathy became fire, and all the dead foliage that was on us now burns bright for you. We're walking in the joy of your promises, now that we have chosen to live in trust and generosity. Somewhere between then and now, you've changed us from the inside out. And we believe you'll do it again. Provide for us now, God. We are believing and praying for greater miracles. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 27 through 38. It might seem like an odd passage, to be honest, when I begin to read it. Uh, but I'm going to give you two sermons in one, and one's only going to last about maybe three minutes. The other's going to last quite a while. Uh, but I'm going to break this passage down for you. Then I'm going to narrow the passage down for you um, based around this topic. Here's what we're going to learn today, the benefits of lifestyle generosity. So February, the month of February, begins a whole new theme um, as we're looking at this, this, the series Greater. Obviously, we are on a countdown towards commitment um, in our expansion series. You're going to hear more about that at the end of the message. Um, so we sort of have an announcement today of sort of where we are in our growth and, and where you are needed. And so you sort of have an idea of where we are all growing. Because we realize that for most of you, you only see Sunday morning. You really may not know what happens Monday through Saturday here with staff, with ministries, with all that is happening on property and off property. And as best we can, we want to bring you up to speed um, on that and where we're headed. But I want to read this entire portion of text to you this morning. And so you see the verses, you see the chapter. Let's begin reading at verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as I, was, as I wish that others would do to you, do also to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Now hang on here. He's going to repeat this phrase three times, which is significant. When you're studying the Bible, find out what words are often repeated, what phrases are often repeated, and that then sort of becomes the, uh, the thrust of that. There's a reason why he's writing this. So that means he's bringing us to a point. He's sharing the point. Then he takes us after the point. Here it is. For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those who, from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend and expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Now let's finish these little verses right here, just two of them. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Here it is. Here's his, his entire point of verse 27 to now. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. How can you and I develop a lifestyle of generosity and what are even going to be the benefits? Because let's be honest, when you're reading the first few verses, you, if you're like me, you kind of want to read through verse 27, 28, and 29 kind of fast. Like, 
Really, God, you want me to do that to some people that are not really nice to me? We want to read through that, if you will, sort of quickly and not apply it. But there are benefits to that. So here's the sermon that's in like three minutes, maybe shorter than that. So I want to break this passage down for you really quickly. Okay, so I need you to listen quick because I'm going to talk quick so you can get it quick so we can quickly get into why he's writing this. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? All right, here we go. Here's what he's saying in a nutshell. Christians should have, number one, what he embraces. Christians should have an embracing attitude. That's the first few verses that he writes about. So there are three parts that he's writing. And the first one in the terms of generosity, he says Christians should be known for an embracing attitude. Secondly, he says Christians should be known for a forgiving disposition. Like, you know, remember the old bumper sticker that said, honk if you love Jesus, and maybe you honked at that person, and they turned around and spoke French to you, and you're like, do you remember why you had a bumper sticker there? Okay. Christians should be known for having a forgiving disposition. And number three, Christians should have a generous heart. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Stop. Now, often we only apply that verse in terms of what, give, what we're given on Sunday morning, in terms of the bucket. We only, we only apply that towards what comes out of our wallet. But he's talking about here an, an embracing attitude, a forgiving disposition, and a generous heart. The opposite here is what he's saying. Like, even lost people do that. So what's different about you than a lost person? Christ in you. And what is the difference that Christ makes in you? In other words, God loves, listen, a cheerful giver as compared to stubborn, not embracing, sinful, not forgiving, and stingy, not generous. If we're not careful, Christians can be some of the most stubborn, sinful, stingy people. And yet we're the ones that are, are the recipients of the grace of God. And he says, if the sinners can do it, you can too. If the sinners can do it, you can too. If the sinners can do it, you can too. And then he goes on to say, and even more so. Uh, that's the whole point of verse 37 and 38. So let's talk about this really, really quickly. What is a lifestyle of generosity? And so now we're going to pull from this text the principles that were taught. Because when you look at this, where it sort of lines up in the teaching of Christ, many call this sort of an extension of the Beatitudes. Christ's first words, his first sermons, blessed is, blessed is, blessed is, eight, the eight Beatitudes. They sort of call this an extension of that. Like he's trying to paint a picture for you and I. What does the life of a Christian look like? This is all new to them. What, what does a follower of Christ look like? This may be even new to you. You're sort of wondering, what, what does this look like? What's different about me than someone who does not have Christ other than I just go to church, other than I own a Bible, other than I listen to Z88.3 or whatever station? Like, what's different about me than someone who does not have Christ? These are the talks that he has. And so he begins to break down for us what is a lifestyle of generosity. Now, we can pull from these principles and attach them to the Word of God and get certain principles. Does that make sense? This is where we're headed. So when he talks about generosity over 2,000 times, and he says that Christians should have an embracing attitude, a forgiving disposition, and a generous heart, here's what we know. First of all, a lifestyle of generosity puts our worldly possessions into a biblical perspective. In other words, if we're not careful, we can think we own these things. If we're not careful, we think we deserve these things. If we're not careful, we will pursue those things, idolize those things, and not utilize those things in the priority at which God had placed them. Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Now, to be fair... When he says, all these things shall be added to you, he literally was talking about the basics of clothing, the basics of food, the basics of life. You and I cannot use this as what we used to call the pink Cadillac verse. You know what I mean? The name it and claim it, blab it and grab it kind of a thing. That, that God wants me to have this and therefore if I claim it, if I drive by it and I claim it, God will give it to me. What he's saying to you and I is you and I will have the basics of life. But listen, it's out of utilizing the basics of life that God will help us prioritize the essential of life, which is God and his righteousness. And that's what separates us from the rest of the world. The world sees that you and I have a different priority and therefore we have a different utility of what God is giving to us. That's the first one. Here's the second one. 
A lifestyle of generosity teaches us that giving, and this is, this is the big point of, of Luke uh, chapter 6, that giving is not separated from our behavior. Most often we only attach giving to something that happens when a need arises. Most often we only attach giving to what happens on Sunday morning at the end of a worship service when we talk about giving or when we see somebody in need on the side of the street. You see, most of the time we, we only attach that toward us. But the Bible tells us that a lifestyle of generosity is not measured so much by what you put in the bucket. Generosity is not so much measured by how much you're giving back to God. Generosity here is measured by your behavior. This is why I have said, and I've sort of led you up to this so you'll be ready to hear it. So when you do hear it, you get it. If you get this one area of life right with God, stewardship, all the other areas that God requires of you will make sense. You cannot, should not, let me rephrase that, you probably can, but should not separate sort of giving from God and then living another way. My grandfather used to say all the time, he would say, some people live for God on Sunday and live for the devil on Monday. Right? So we, we sort of know, we, we sort of compartmentalize our life. Like today, Sunday, I'm going to go do the Sunday thing and be the Sunday person. But tomorrow is business. And God, if you, you know I got to make a living, and so uh, it's not going to be a lie, but it's going to be a twisting. It's going to be this. Or, God, you know it's going to be this or that, but it's not going to be actual, this or that. Well, we know, you and I, if we're not careful, we can go out and manipulate things on our own, and we can carefully separate parts of Christianity from others. Stewardship is not just giving to the bucket. Stewardship is not just 10%. That's the starting place. And the moment you begin to start that journey, God actually begins to transform not just what you do, but who you are in Christ. You should not, you cannot, if you're living for Christ, separate generosity from your behavior. It's who you are. It's who you become. And that's what Jesus Christ was teaching here. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 23 and 24. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. How often have you and I walked into the worship center and our heart wasn't right in some area and we knew that? Like when I'm up there, I'm not, this isn't a pious statement. It's really, it's not at all. It's actually a fearful statement. When I'm sitting there, I am literally begging God, like, don't let my heartbeat stop. <laughs> like I'm begging God, if you can use me, use me. If you can fill me, fill me. If you can anoint me, anoint me. But Holy Spirit, I need you to show up into this place because it's not about my words. It's not about the songs that we just sang. It's all about your presence in our midst. So if there's anything in my life, that there's anything in my heart that needs to be cleansed, either known or unknown, Heavenly Father, forgive me. I do not want to step up there and make an absolute fool of myself. That's you and I. That's not a pious statement. That's, every, that's what our prayer should be every day of our life. It shouldn't just be on Sunday morning. Well, here I go to church. No, tomorrow morning, God, if you can use me, use me. If you can fill me, fill me. If you can forgive me, forgive me. Father, for an area of my life, known or unknown, that is not where it needs to be, Heavenly Father, correct that. But right now, I am submitting myself to you. Stewardship cannot be separated from behavior. I don't put something in the bucket and then go treat somebody poorly. I don't sing the worship songs only on Sunday morning, but not live for God in every other area of my life. Listen, we at a, as a church, I hope you know this, we don't play church. I don't play church. And we don't play church. We, we don't come here to be pious and pretentious. And everything we try to structure ourselves to be is to say, God, we are absolutely available to you every day of our life. And wherever you need to move, move in that area. That is our prayer. And so when it comes to sort of asking for money or raising funds or expanding the campus, you have to hear me one more time. It's not about a building. It's what God is building in your life. Amen. And when you and I get that right, then everything else follows. You see, what needs to happen here on Sunday morning is you go out of here changed. Every Sunday that you come into the presence of God, this is sort of half time in life. You and I need to go out of here different in some area, big or small, we need to leave here different than we arrived so everything about what is happening now changes our behavior. 
And you and I know that. We cannot separate this area of our life. Martin Luther said this, the famed theologian. He said, there are three conversions necessary. The conversion of the heart, of the mind, and of the purse. And all three need to happen. And he's so accurate. The Bible teaches you and I that giving is not separated from our behavior. Someone said this, the test of our money and possessions is not what they are doing for us. But what we allow it to do to us. You see, most of us measure our possessions are what it's doing for us. Does that make sense? Like because I'm wearing this or I'm going here or I'm driving this or I'm living here or I'm making this or I'm vacationing here. Whatever. Things, right? If we're not careful, we think the measure of our worth is what the, sort of the blessings, money and possessions is what they're doing for us. The Bible is teaching you and I in this area of stewardship. It's what we're allowing it to do to us. How are we allowing it to grow in our faith in Christ? How are we allowing it to trust God in times of plenty and in times of poverty? Both of them. And I think that message is next week. But anyway, here's the third one. A lifestyle of generosity is a test of spiritual living. Now, he amps it up. I mean, with every point that's given, with every principle we're, we're mentioning here, literally the, the, the circle gets closer on this idea of stewardship and generosity. Stewardship, a lifestyle of generosity, is a test of spiritual living. Luke 16, 11. If you then have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to true riches? Now, again, we looked at that. That means a number of things. Yes, it means that if God can't trust you with a dollar, he may not give you two dollars. But it's so much more than that. See, we still measure it based upon how many dollars we have. The greater thing that he's trying to measure is if we can't prove ourselves trustworthy with the things of the world, how will God give us things that can't be measured by this world? How would God trust us with a greater ministry? How would God trust us with a powerful Bible verse or a meaningful worship song? Why would God waste moving, if you will, in our life in this one area if he knows you and I won't listen or we won't respond or we won't receive from? Here's the one dangerous thing about Sunday morning you need to be aware of. When you are exposed to the preaching of the Word of God, you have now been exposed to the preaching of the Word of God. Listen, no matter if you respond to it or if you don't respond to it, nonetheless, you have still been exposed to the teaching of the Word of God. Now you are held accountable to what you've heard. Do you understand that? And I pray the attendance doesn't drop next Sunday. But, but literally, whether you decide it or not, you need to understand this. As was prayed earlier... When I speak Jesus, we might live in this world. Jesus prayed that while they are in this world, they are no longer of this world. You and I have to learn that we don't only live for what we see. We live for what we do not see. And the Bible is teaching you and I that right now there is spiritual warfare taking place for your life, for your family, for your heart, for your marriage, for your commitment, for your decisions, for your Monday. Right now, there is spiritual warfare that is, that is taking place. Whether you respond or not respond does not stop that. You understand that. But how you respond can obviously affect how you walk into it, through it, and out of it. But nonetheless, you are now being held accountable for a principle from the Word of God that God says, this is how you and I should live our life. Stewardship is a test of spiritual living. The question being asked three times, what separates you from a sinner? A sinner loves people that don't treat them nicely. A sinner gives to people that don't expect things back. A sinner does. Three times he reiterates that. You and I are to live so much differently than that that when people look at you, they have to ask, what's different about your life? You, you don't, you're not responding like the rest of the world. And listen, you might feel like you're responding now different than the rest of the world by showing up to church. But what it's done is when you, how it's demonstrated when you leave here and go out into the world that needs to see Christ. Stewardship is a test of spiritual living. In other words, generosity is a theological statement. Do I trust God? What do I believe about God? How have I seen God move? Am I going to respond to God's moving in my life? Here's another one. What is the benefit of lifestyle of generosity? It protects against financial bondage. We preached that two Sundays ago in Trust Fall. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Read the next two words with me. You, you cannot. You know, okay, listen. This is, this is what's called a, a, an immutable fact of God. Like gravity is an immutable thing. Like you might say, I don't believe in gravity, and then go out there and jump off the building. You won't defy gravity. You'll demonstrate it. Okay, so this is one of the immutable facts that God, an immutable law of God that he has put in place. When God says you cannot do something, you cannot do it. In other words, you can't be one person on Sunday morning and a different person on Monday. You may have put on different clothes on Sunday, but the heart was still the same on Sunday and Monday. You cannot be someone different in one business situation and be somebody different in another business situation if you are a true follower of Christ. The heart will be the heart committed to Christ. And this is what he's calling you and I to be. You cannot. It is impossible, God is saying, to confess, I love God with all my heart and not give God all your heart. Do you understand that? It, it, it protects you and I against financial bondage. Whenever we become a slave to something, we become a slave to it. And you and I are called to be bond servants of Christ, bonded to him with the understanding that he is in charge of my life in every area of my life. I cannot separate the secular from the sacred. It is all sacred to God, and you and I need to approach life that way. Here's another one. The lifestyle of generosity protects, it get, provides victory over materialism. It provides victory over materialism. And I think we've read this passage before, but let's turn over and listen to 1 Timothy chapter 16, first, uh, for, uh, I mean, chapter uh, 6, verses 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, remember we said that last week, like you're rich. If you've got name brand food in the pantry, you even have a pantry, like if you're not sweeping a dirt floor like others are in the world around us, you're rich. Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. The Bible, this is another immutable thing. God has told you and I that the things of this world are not certain. So why do you and I give so much of our time to things that are going to ultimately fail, right? But on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy, they are to do good, to be rich in good works. There's your wealth. To be rich or to be generous and to be ready to share. Why? Storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You and I, every one of us, and I'm just like you, every one of us wake up every day searching for like life. Fulfillment in job, fulfillment and joy in marriage, like to have that paycheck, I get it. To pay the bills, I get it. To be able to purchase these things, to provide these things, I understand that. Those are the basics. You and I wake up every day and we honestly want to experience life. But if we're not careful, we will pursue life how the world defines life, how the world defines joy, how the world defines contentment, how the world finds, de defines purpose, how the world defines meaning and worth. If we're not careful, we'll pursue their meaning rather than the, the meaning that God has put in front of you and I. And the Bible says this is how we do that. A lifestyle of generosity continues to keep my eyes on Christ and not the things that I think give me life, but to the one that does give me life. So what does a lifestyle of generosity look like? What are the results? How will I know that I'm sitting in that, if you will? Here's, here's how. Three things. Number one, it makes me joyful. It makes me... Do, do you know I have never... I, I'm, I'm being honest. I have never met an angry tither. I honestly haven't. I've never met an angry, generous person. The only people that typically get angry when you talk about money are the people that are already not giving. That's just the truth. I have never met, the Bible tells you, and I listen to 1 Chronicles 29 9, then the people rejoice. Because they had given willingly. For with the whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Do you want to know why I think I have never met an angry, generous person? Have you ever noticed this? That the word miser is the root word for miserable? 
Have you ever noticed that? In other words, Scrooge, if you will. Like whenever you and I sort of get our hands on things, we often think that those things are of our worth. They define who we are. But when I realize, when, when I quit living life like this, and the moment that I just let go and I let God fill my hands, then all of a sudden I just watch God continue to give the hand. I let go and he fills. I let go and he fills. I let. But whenever you and I do this, we don't like it. We don't like it when God is asking or others are asking for things. But when I realize that my hands aren't big enough to hold all that God has given me, something happens in the life of a believer. During this series, of course, I, I receive at least two phone calls or texts a week. Got off the phone uh, last week with someone. They were like, do you remember when? And they're like, do you remember when my life went through this difficulty and then this difficulty? And I was facing this and I was facing this. And I sat down with somebody and they said, are you giving? And I was like, are you crazy is what they said. And as soon as they began to give out, out of nowhere, all of a sudden jobs showed up. All of a sudden things were taken care of. It's like as soon as I did that, the floodgates opened. And I can't tell you that is the story that I often hear. I, but listen, I know. Can we just be honest for just a moment? I, I know what it's like to sit in that moment and you're facing so many things and God asks something of you, the human heart with human eyes and human hands says, no way. One plus one equals two, God. Come on. And in this case, one plus one, common core math is minus two, whatever, right? Like <laughs> that math just don't add up. But in so many cases, what God ends up doing is you have no idea. One plus one might equal a hundred. It might equal a thousand. It might equal a million. You can't quantify that number when God moves. All you know is God moves. And then after a while, you sort of get addicted to watching and experiencing God move. Study after study after study reveals this. Generous people are less depressed and suffer significantly less mental anxieties than the miserly. You and I know that. Again, miser, the word miser is the root of miserable. Here's the second thing, that a blessing of generosity. It blesses me in return. Now, you and I don't do that for that, but we can expect that. Like the heart isn't always driven, well, I'm going to give and, God, and God's going to give back. Right? But we can expect that. Listen to the Bible, Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your lap for the measure, with the measure. Listen, for with the measure, listen, for with the, me, one more time, listen. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. What measurement of faith right now are you using to measure God's movement in your life? If you are using a two-inch ruler, you can expect two inches of blessing. What measurement right now are you stepping out in giving? I know you're like, yeah, I have a one-inch bank account and God's asking for an inch and a half. Yes. And all of a sudden your bank account or whatever in so many ways... You won't even know. Like, I can't promise you money. I can't. That's not, that's not, that's the prosperity gospel. If you're obedient in this area, this is what God will do. I can't promise you that. I, all I can promise is God will show up in your life and you will be amazed. Because that's what the Bible teaches you and I. Give and it will be given to you. The illusion here when, when they were writing this was like packing coffee beans or packing uh, beans or flour in a bag. And how they would pour it, they would shake it and it would be pressed down. Pour it, shake it and press down. Have you ever like bought a bag of chips? <laughs> you're quick learners. And you're like, this is a $4 bag of chip and I can squeeze that much. I, I'm like... What happened to this? Shove that stuff in there, man. Like, come. Have you, ever, have you ever gone to one of those bars where you build your own bowl and you just watch them grab a little bit of lettuce and you're like, a, a, a little more lettuce, please? <laughs> the Bible is showing you and I that, that what God does is he literally puts in, shakes, presses down, puts in, shakes, and presses down, puts in, shakes, and presses down to when it's running over. That's the picture of the Word of God. And I love that, 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 that illustration because he's literally pressing it down into your life so that you will actually know that it's him. You and I, listen, you and I, I'm telling you right now, when we do not give to God, when we're not living a generous lifestyle, we will feel pressed by the world's standards. 
But when you give and you're living a lifestyle of generosity, you will feel pressed by the power of God. And the two are absolutely different. Right now, you're living under the pressures of this world, undoubtedly. But when God steps in, he presses his spirit into your spirit and provides into your lap in a way that you cannot measure. So the question is, for what's your measurement? Do you have a two-inch faith, but you're expecting God to bless you 12 inches? Do you have a three-inch faith? You get the point, right? The measure that you're giving your life to Christ is what you'll receive plus. But not only that, it's the measurement you're going to be measured back against. But the Bible tells you and I, it blesses me in return. Here's the fourth and the last one. It keeps me, at, or the third and the last one, it keeps me at the foot of the cross. That is the whole point of generosity. A lifestyle benefit of generosity is it keeps me at the foot of the the cross. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Come on, we know that. He gave. Giving is a part of the character of God. And you and I know this. Whenever I am practicing generosity, it keeps me at the foot of the cross. It reminds me what was given to me, who gave it to me, why it's available to me, how it's available to me. And I don't know about you, but I need to be kept at the foot of the cross. As a constant reminder, life's not about me. Because if I'm not careful, I can make life about me. I can make life about my situation. And keeping me at the foot of the cross reminds me of that. Someone said this, giving is a mindset, not a tax bracket. Generosity is an attitude of surrender. Realize that I am lost without Christ. But with Christ, I am absolutely blessed. Did you know this about money? Money only reveals what you already are. You're either a giver or you're a consumer. More money is not going to make you more of a giver. It's just going to make you more of a consumer if you're not a giver. More money only reveals what's already in your heart. And so I know you're praying, Lord, I will give it my time if there were more I would give of this if there were more. It's only when you give does the creator of the universe have the ability to make more, if you will, to provide more. Hang on to this statement as we end because we begin next sermon with this statement. Stewardship is the area of life that tells how men make money and how God makes men. What is God making of you right now in the area of stewardship? You have been exposed to the teaching of the word of God. And whether you respond or whether you do not respond, we are held accountable to how he moves and what we've heard. We are called to not live the same as the sinners because we are recipients of the grace of God. We are called to live different than them and to live a lifestyle of generosity. The Bible tells you and I we are to have an embracing attitude, a forgiving spirit, and a generous heart. That's where we're at. Amen? Ooh.